And I hope that at some time in your life, Steve, this is a great book, and it is still a great book. And when you read books written, as this was 150 years ago, you find yourself connecting with the thought of somebody who lived at a different time, in a different society, in a different century, a different era. And you will connect with Darwin. Just read one chapter of it, and you'll see exactly what I mean. But that would take a little long. So I thought, well, explain evolution of 455 pages, too long. We need a shorter time period. And where would you find a shorter time period? Um, how about we explain evolution in 30 seconds of the sort that a poor, unsuspecting scientist might ask, be asked to do if he went on the Colbert Report with Stephen Colbert. So here you're going to hear an explanation of evolution in 30 seconds. Our guest is a professor of biology at Brown University and a leading critic of intelligent design. I'm going to ask him where he gets off. Please welcome Ken Miller. Come on. Come on, let's get it. Oh, God. We're getting it. We're getting it. Thank you so much for doing the show. This is Happy such a thrill here. for me. It's a thrill for me. Let me ask you something. Walk me through. I want to give you a shot here. <laughs> Explain evolution from the primordial soup to how I got here today in my limo. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> Walk me through it. Take uh, 30 seconds. Okay. How about if we crawl? Basically, what evolution tells us is that we are united. We're put together in a fabric of life with every other living thing on this planet. Uh -huh. um, up until about, oh, two, three hundred years ago, people thought that life on Earth had never changed. But they immediately became aware at the end of the 17th and 18th century that life had changed. And the process of change, explaining that, has been one of biology's biggest projects for the last 150 years. And that explanation is evolution. Well, Colbert had more to say. And if you want to see the rest of it, you can Google Ken Miller on the Colbert Report. And you'll find it somewhere on the Internet for the entire six-minute interview. But I want to come back to a couple of things that I said very briefly in that 30-second exchange um, about evolution. And that is one of the first things that people became aware of, which serves as the basis really for the theory of evolution, is the observation that life has changed over time. We take this for granted today, but it wasn't taken for granted in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was a surprising and startling fact. Fossils are the record of that change. And not just fossils themselves, but where they're found, what fossils they're found in association with, and which layers they are found in. And fossils are not always fragmentary. In many cases, they are extraordinary records that tell us a great deal about what an organism looked like and even acted like, and in some cases, even what it ate. Because in many cases, fossils preserve soft tissues, including the digestive system of these organisms. So that was, in a way, the first fact. The second startling fact was these changes occur in a pattern. This is one of those charts that nobody is ever actually supposed to be able to read. So don't worry about it if you can't read it. But what has happened here is the geological periods are sketched over here. And the first appearance of major groups of organisms is shown here. So for example, microscopic organisms appeared literally billions of years ago. Multicellular animals in the Ediacaran period about 700 million years ago. Uh, the first representatives of the vertebrates and others in the Cambrian. Then jawless fish came later, bony fish, amphibians, insects, reptiles, dinosaurs appeared about here. Dinosaurs uh, became extinct during the Cretaceous, mammals, birds, and actually the most recent major group of organisms at the phylum level to appear um, isn't us, it's not mammals, it's the flowering plants, the most common plants in the world. The flowering plants didn't appear until the Cretaceous, about 125 million years ago. So not only has life changed, but it has changed in a very particular pattern. And analyzing that pattern of change, it's very clear that the changes were successive. And what I mean by that is very simple. The first amphibian to appear looked more like a fish than any amphibian that has ever existed since. The first reptiles to appear looked more like amphibians than any reptiles that had ever existed since. And the very first mammals to appear look so much like reptiles that they actually are called the reptile-like mammals. And this notion of successive change impressed an awful lot of people well before Charles Darwin. When Darwin, as a young man, traveled around the world on a ship called the Beagle, he was struck by something that he called the succession of types. 
Got to remember, this guy grew up in England, never been off of the island of England. Suddenly he's in South America and he sees the weirdest animal that any European could ever hope to see, namely an armadillo. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen armadillos in the flesh. Travel to the southwestern United States and you'll have that pleasure. They serve armadillo, properly cooked, in all sorts of restaurants. It's a delightful treat. I can tell you about this. But it really struck Darwin. These are really weird animals. Now, in addition to studying them, sketching them, dissecting them, and yes, eating them, uh, Darwin was struck by the fact that there were fossils that were unique to South America of organisms like this one called the glyptodont. These fossils looked remarkably like armadillos, even though they were much larger and they had many internal differences in their structure. And it struck Darwin, why should the extinct armadillo-like species that he found, and armadillos themselves, be found on just one continent? And that continent, he thought at the time, was South America. Why should they be found together? It suggested something. And what it suggested to Darwin was ancestry. The reason armadillos today are found on the continent where the most armadillo-like fossils are found is because these guys might have been the ancestors of these guys. Not just armadillos. There were extraordinary fossils, which Darwin found, of extinct giant sloths in South America. And lo and behold, the modern sloth, which is found in Central and South America, clearly is related to it. And Darwin wrote in a book that was published more than 20 years before The Origin of Species, this wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living, the fossil and the living, will, I don't doubt, throw more light on the appearance of organic beings on their earth and their disappearance than any other class of facts. The fossil record shouted out that there was an ancestor-descendant relationship. Darwin was also a very experienced cultivator of plants and a breeder of animals. And he realized that vegetables that we think of as remarkably different, such as Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, have all been produced from the same ancestral wild mustard seed, believe, wild mustard plant, believe it or not, by careful cultivation in the hands of plant breeders. So he realized that plants in nature show so much variation that a breeder can select for these different characteristics to produce plants that to us look completely different. And he realized that nature does exactly the same thing. And Darwin's insight was that there was a force in nature which he called natural selection. And that natural selection automatically selected for animals and plants that were best adapted to their environment. The variation that appears in nature is acted upon by natural selection. And Darwin put this sketch, it was the only picture, in The Origin of Species to illustrate how he thought his process would work. And that is a species would develop increasing variation until finally it's split into two, a process called speciation that results in the formation of new species. Once diversity divides the species into two, each of these new species can be acted on separately by natural selection. And this is where species come from. Contrary to popular imagination, evolution doesn't transform one species into another. It takes existing species and splits them into two or three separate species, which then go their own way and evolve in separate directions. What impressed Darwin was that he thought he could actually see this process in motion. On the Galapagos Islands, across the, off the western coast of South America, he found a number of species of birds which clearly had different styles of life. Of life. Some of them were woodpecker-like, some of them were finch-like, some of them were warbler-like. He bagged these animals, meaning he shot them, preserved them, brought them back to England, and gave them to bird experts. And the bird experts told him, you aren't going to believe this. That thing you thought was a woodpecker, it's a finch. The thing you thought was a warbler, it's a finch. The thing you thought was a finch, well, it is a finch. And it turns out that on these islands, there were no fewer than 13 different species of finch that in just a few million years had evolved from a single common ancestor that had flown to these distant islands from the South American mainland. Because this was, or these were, the first birds to colonize it, these birds split and split and split again and were able to adapt to every one of these individual styles of life on the island. It's worth noting this same process is happening right now.